Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to present uh, to all of you a little bit about my senior Keystone project, uh, which I have cutely named Super Power Bytes. I'll explain why um, in a few slides. But to start with, I would just like to contextualize the problem that I'm addressing, which specifically is that children who grow up in Boston, specifically who attend Boston Public Schools, um, simply do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. And this can have um, long-term health ramifications uh, beginning in childhood with conditions such as failure to thrive, which happens as early as um, a few months and uh, during toddlerhood. Um, but Inadequate intake affects you throughout the lifespan. Um, it, is, it leads to numerous health conditions, um, heart disease, cancer, it all plays roles. And so adequate intake is essential. Um, and these three, or these three factors are going to be the ones I'm going to be focusing on today. So Boston Public Schools, in terms of, um, I'm specifically addressing children. So Boston Public Schools offers universal free meals to all students since 2013. And while that's a fantastic thing, um, you don't have to have a special card to show that you get a free meal. No matter what your income status, you're eligible for breakfast and lunch. If the food doesn't taste good, you're not going to eat it. And so therefore, you will not be consuming the uh, cor correct amount of nutrients. So that's also a factor that I'll be discussing. And so to address these um, issues, I decided to create a product made from whole food ingredients that is nutrient rich and a full serving provides um, a serving of fruits and vegetables to the consumer. So I'm going to start with some background and also define some of the terms that I mentioned in the previous slide, specifically food accessibility, affordability, palatability, as well as food deserts. So this graphic created by the Institute for um, Contemporary, or the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, excuse me, um, it's slightly dated, it's from 2013. However, uh, the trends, unfortunately, um, are still very accurate. These have continued to today. So numerous neighborhoods comprise the city of Boston, and the various neighborhoods um, are unique in a variety of ways, including uh, median household income. So as you can see, Back Bay, which I imagine most of us are familiar with, we're very near it right now, um, the median household income is $86,000. By comparison, another neighborhood, um, Roxbury, mean ho median household income is significantly less at $28,000. And if all things were equal, um, income would not affect your quality of life or a variety of other factors. But as we know, we don't live in a vacuum. And so how much money you make, where you live, significantly impacts not only your well-being, but uh, specifically your health. And the aspect of your health that I'm going to be talking about is, um, or what's affected by that, is food access. So does anyone know what a food desert is? Or does anyone not know what a food desert is? A couple people? OK. So a food desert is an area in which access to quality and affordable food is limited or non-existent. And so Roxbury can be considered a food desert because as you can see with this lovely little, they did a great job with graphics. Um, there are very few grocery stores in Roxbury. And for the ones that do exist, it's very difficult to access them, whether it's because they're a very long walk away, you have to take a bus, then another bus, then maybe the orange line to get there, which can be very expensive. For a variety of reasons, it's hard to access fresh fruits and vegetables. And as this um, table, I think, well demonstrates, once you get there, there's um, additional disparities due to where you live. So if you go to the grocery store in Back Bay, possibly the Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or something, you might spend $4.49 on a gallon of milk. But if you live in Roxbury, you might have to take the tea, which is $2.50 one way, um, for who knows how long, maybe like 30 minutes, let's say. And then when you get there, you're already paying 50 cents more for a gallon of milk, even though you make about a third of what the average income is in um, Back Bay. So as you can see, food access and affordability are major issues in Boston that affect not only adults, but also um, the children that they're bringing up. Which brings me to children consumption of fruits and vegetables. So as I mentioned before, um, in 2013, Boston Public Schools made all meals, breakfast and lunch, uh, free and accessible to all children in the Boston Public School System, which is phenomenal and great and will definitely contribute to uh, fruit and vegetable intake if the food is palatable. However, as a study in 2015 showed on um, choice architecture in Boston Public Schools, children simply aren't eating enough of the entrees to get uh, the adequate intake. So they did this great intervention where they brought chefs in working with the collaboration um, with Project Bread. And they had chefs uh, 
modify the recipes so that they were not only healthier, but also um, more attractive, basically improving the meals. However, they found that even with that chef intervention, children were only consuming max about 75% of the entrees, and that's the entire um, serving of, or the entire plate of food. When you break it down and look at specific food groups, specifically uh, fruits and vegetables, children were consuming about a quarter to about a third of the regular serving of fruit. And then with vegetables, it's even worse, um, maybe about a fifth of the regular serving. Children of this age group, which is specifically 6 to 12, so um, elementary school and then early middle, middle school, should be consuming two to three servings of fruit and three to, ser three to four servings of vegetables. So as you can see, and most kids get the majority of their food while they're at school. You eat breakfast, you eat lunch. So if they're only getting about this much per meal, there's clearly an issue. Which brings me to um, my attempted solution. So in order to address this insufficiency of fruit and vegetable intake, I created Super Power Bites, which I hope some of you have tried. Um, Abby passed them around earlier. And so in order to create this product, I used whole food ingredients um, to create a product that provides a full serving of fruits and vegetables. Um, it, has minimal added sugar, and of that added sugar, it's all natural sources. And ideally, um, the goal was for it to look and taste good so that students would eat it, and then that will contribute to their fruit and vegetable intake for the day. And as I mentioned before, the target population was early, was elementary and early middle school age children. So I imagine that most of you are familiar with the majority of the ingredients on here, although some may be unfamiliar. These are some of the main ingredients that I use to create this product. So things that are probably familiar, I hope, uh, bananas, strawberries, spinach, but ones that might not be as familiar to the average <coughs> consumer, maitake mushrooms in the bottom right-hand corner. It's a variety of mushrooms that is especially rich in vitamin D, which is really important for Boston children because of the seasons here. There's a um, greater risk for children to be vitamin D deficient. In this central bottom panel, it looks like peanut butter, but it's actually sunflower seed butter, which is a great nut butter alternative for use in public school systems because peanut allergies are such an issue. And additionally, it provides, um, it's a great source of mono, mono and polyunsaturated fats, as well as vitamin E and protein. And then um, over here on the left, uh, whole grain, amaranth. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but it's uh, touted as a superfood. And um, I use that for like a little bit of crunch. It's very good. It's almost like popcorn, like tiny popcorn. Highly recommend it to everyone. So in order to create this product, it went through many iterations um, that were attempted and then revised for a variety of reasons, some of which were um, to improve palatability, texture, appearance. So in the bottom left right now, I have a picture I took before mixing some of the ingredients together. Um, those are, that's like an earlier version. That's a later version. So as you can see, some of the ingredients changed based on color, but then also to contribute to that full serving of fruits and vegetables that I mentioned before. Now, if I can direct your attention to the right-hand side with the nutrition information panel, there are a few different nutrients that I'd like to point out. Uh, the first one is the dietary fiber, 24%. So the reason why the fiber is so high and why I want it to be so high was because the majority of your dietary fiber comes from your fruit and vegetable intake. And fiber is associated with a variety, or having a significant amount of fiber in your diet is associated with a variety of um, improved health outcomes. So making sure that that was um, at a pretty high level was very important to me. Additionally, protein is really huge because in addition to not just serving as a source of fruits and vegetables, when kids eat this, they, you also the goal is to have them feel full afterwards so they don't reach for another snack. So having eight grams of protein in this product was also um, an additional benefit. So overall, the goal, as I mentioned, was to create this product, hopefully, delicious and appealing. I didn't see anyone spit it out, so like counting that as a win. Thank you, guys. Um, and as I said, it's a full serving of fruits and vegetables. And um, these last two points, I think, are probably some of the strongest, uh, strongest um, characteristics of this product. It's vegetarian and free from gluten, peanuts, tree nuts, eggs, and dairy, which is essential for when trying to implement uh, products like this in the Boston public school system or any school system in general just due to health concerns. Um, and then with specific and non-specific to Boston, uh, it's easy to modulate this recipe depending on the various characteristics or needs of a certain city. So for example, if say 
Chicago had a high, uh, vitamin C deficiency problem, you could alter the ingredients of this to address that health concern. There were also a number of limitations, uh, some of which include I never formally taste tested with the target population for a variety of reasons, mostly IRB. Um, however, I did have a wide range of um, people try this, including a few individuals who say they never eat vegetables, ever. They hate them. And they said that the product is pretty OK, so I take that, again, as a win. Um, additionally, this was made, as I said, um, just in a student apartment. So I say it's peanut free and all these things free, but if you have a severe allergy, please don't eat it. Uh, future directions. Um, I included to address this issue of um, not necessarily testing this product with the target population. So conducting a research group uh, or a research study or a focus group um, ideally would be a next step. I also created a business plan, as you can see on the right, um, so that in theory it could be implemented in the Boston public school system. I also created packaging and design, uh, the super power bites, uh, the motivation for Naming it that is that if you're eating all of your fruits and vegetables, then you'll have strong bones that you can run really fast and jump and do all the things that a healthy, amazing body can accomplish. So that was my part. I also just want to address a couple um, people that without their yeah, help, I don't think this project would have been possible. Um, my advisor, uh, professor, and Dr. Davidson Hamer, as well as individuals from Sergeant Choice Nutrition who were essential to conducting the nutrient analysis for this project, as well as my roommate who I think tried every single iteration of this project. <laughs> so shout out to her because, wow. Um, as well as the men's tennis team and the individuals in the Chen Lab. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. How many like iterations did you go through before settling on that? Um, as of right now, I believe I have 12 post-it note recipes on the cabinets of my kitchen. So minimum 15, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Nicole? How would you see this actually being implemented in a public school system? Like, would these be given out for free with the lunch? Would they be served in the classroom? Would they be served yeah. every day or maybe like a couple of times a week? So ideally, and I addressed it in the business plan, um, although it was really small and I imagine you probably weren't able to see it, um, it would be offered for free in school, like say like at the end of the day or something, just provide it as a snack, but then would also be available for purchase in the corner stores that are more prevalent in uh, certain neighborhoods of Boston, as well as at farmer's markets, maybe Whole Foods, things like that. <coughs> yes. Would the actual device we have now a full serving? So if you eat five to six of those, depending on the size, I think I made them a little small today, then that's a full serving. Yeah. Is there, um, are you seeing a potential for maybe like, um, like urban agriculture being involved with this too, where you have school programs that promote growing produce there in like raised beds or other plots like there on the school grounds, and then the kids are harvesting those crops and then being able to turn those into the ingredients? Because some of those ingredients might be more accessible than others. I mean, Mm -hmm. Beets can be pretty much grown anywhere in this kind of a climate, but then maybe like I don't know where amaranth is grown or something. Not like, here. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. Would you be able to find. Or are you seeing a potential, potential where maybe it's like self-sufficient from that regard, and then and then the kids are also sure. getting a sense of where food's coming from, and you know, then mm -hmm. the whole you know from the field or from the soil to the to the plate kind of a thing. Yeah, that I, in theory, if if this were to become an actual thing, I would love for that to happen. I was thinking more um, having it be self-sustaining in the sense of partnering with a community organization such as Haley House, I don't know if you're familiar with them, working with their operation so that not only would the funds going in support them, but also, like I said, be self-sustaining. So yeah, but that would also be really cool. So yeah, uh, yes. Um, has your business plan progressed to a uh, place where you can like, find like a price point for? So I did um, a very, early stage janky price analysis. <laughs> and um, it came out to be, I think, $3. I would adjust the price. Um, so it'd be about $3 for sale in places like Whole Foods, where you can afford to have it cost $3. And then I could still afford for it to be 25 cents in bodegas. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. First of all, yum. <laughs> I really liked it. I have a lunch problem. But is there a product like this that the schools are using now? Is there anything that they're giving for snacks? Um. So across the board, what is mandated 
based on the universal uh, free meal program in public schools, um, you are required to offer breakfast and lunch. Some schools do snacks, it depends on funding, um, but usually the snacks are, I believe, fruit in most schools, which is great. However, you might not necessarily get kids to eat it, and it's not offered in every single school within the BPS system. So, yeah. Okay, that's all we have to talk today.